Exactly. You know? well, I'm going to, I just turned the recording on. We do record these. Um, yeah. We have, I don't even know what our count is up to on our Empire Masterminds page, but it's probably close to 130, 140 people. Um, Millions. What? <laughs> Millions? Wouldn't that be nice? Um, so... <laughs> You know, I think I say this almost every week, but we we record these because not everybody can make it live, you know, at this time. And so we do believe that quite a few people go back and, and watch these recordings, which is super helpful. So good morning, Aaron. Good morning, Bob. Good morning. It is nine o'clock. So let's just obviously be mindful of time. Everybody, welcome to Empire Masterminds. I'm Kelly DeMail with EXP Realty. We've got Bob Snyder on here and his wife are hosts with Bruce and I. Um, Aaron Neubauer with Success Lending is joining us. He loves to give us our little market update for the first couple of minutes of our Empire Mastermind on Wednesday. And then we have a great guest speaker today. So, um, and Asha works with the Snyder team as well. She, and you know, she's always just a great resource for keeping us on track. So at any time, if you guys have questions, feel free to, to jump on in during the presentation, but I'll hand it over to Aaron. Give us kind of a what's going on in, in the industry, if you don't mind. Yeah, well, thanks for a couple minutes here today. Um, just uh, as a heads up, last week we had a dip in interest rates, but then they popped back. Um, as of the moment, we're still right around that 6.99 range for first-time homebuyers. Um the one thing we want to look out for, I don't really see, the feds aren't going to come out and say anything for another couple of months. Everyone wants interest rates to come down. We know it's going to happen right now. The only thing that's really going to move interest rates is just the market itself, a little bit here, a little bit there. Uh, keep an eye on that. Stay in touch with your loan officers. But first time home buyers are still right around that 6.99 range. I don't project anything, anything major happening until June, to be perfectly transparent. So, um, don't hold out. Don't wait. If someone can get into a house now, do it. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity and I just don't, uh, you know, we don't have any other reports coming out either or anything like that anytime soon. So I would just keep focused on uh, thinking they're going to be right around that 7% range for now in the, in the foreseeable future. Okay, perfect. Yeah. I did hear maybe sometime end of May, June, but you know, you never, there's no written rule here. Right. So exactly. Great advice. We'll just keep in touch and, and certainly, if anybody has any questions, if anybody needs any help, reach out to Aaron, um, amazing loan officer here, and he's always willing to help um, with anything that you need and is always available. So with that, uh, we have a fantastic guest speaker today, Troy Emter with Rock Solid Home Inspections. And, um, you know, in this day and age, and especially now with, you know, NAR and all this good stuff, this is where we as agents really have to provide value as an agent. We have to show our value. And um, Troy today is going to provide us with lots of tips and, and ideas and um, information where we will become a little bit more knowledgeable when we're walking through homes and whatnot uh, to be able to add to our value proposition. So without further ado, welcome, Troy. I'll let you kind of give your background and, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Kelly. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen, so bear with me a little bit. And as we go through this presentation, so it's going to be a PowerPoint presentation, I'll share my screen here shortly. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to interrupt at any time. Uh, let's just kind of make it a informal little meeting um, and we'll go from there. So I'm going to try to share my screen here. And can everyone see that okay? Yep. Okay, perfect. So I'm Troy with Rock Solid Home Inspections. Uh, we've been around since 2017. Um, we are, uh, well, let's keep talking about it. Uh, we are located in Maple Grove, uh, but we do service the whole Twin Cities areas. But my background is um, I went to the U of M and I finished out with a drafting degree and I I ran a, a drafting company for about five years uh, based out of Deep Haven. Um, I've been designing and building houses uh, since I was about 20. I did my first one when I was 20. And I really enjoy construction, but I never really wanted to work in it, uh, if that makes any sense. <laughs> I actually swing hammers. But anyways, I, I did enough to understand the whole building concept. I went to school for all this. Um, I built houses, what, every five years. I built pretty much every type of foundation, every type of house, so I can understand houses uh, really well. 
Um, I designed some big houses on Lake Minnetonka for the Carlsons. I designed Pelican Point located out of deep or out of mound. Um, that was a number of years ago. So I have quite a bit of uh, experience with houses. Um, Rock Solid is a multi-inspection company. So we have more than one inspector. We try to locate inspectors throughout the Twin Cities to reduce um, the drive times and just make it a little bit more convenient for people. So we pretty much have two in the Northwest, one in the Southwest and one in the Southeast currently. So that's where we're at. Uh, we're not, we don't want to be a big company. Uh, what we want to be is a company that you can call, text me anytime. I answer my phones. We don't have receptionists. It's, we're just a small, quaint little company. And that's what we want. We want to add value. That's really what we want to do is I think once you get bigger, you start losing that, that the value added um, portion of it. Um, so we are all certified. Uh, so I have the highest national certification in Minnesota. As you guys all know, you don't have to be certified to be a home inspector. We are all certified. Um, and we do service the Twin City broad area. We'll go pretty much anywhere um, that you guys need us to go. Uh, once we're in the busy summer season, uh, we try. We can't go to Brainerd anymore just because it takes too much time. But during the fall, winter, and spring, we'll go to Brainerd for people. No problem. Um, we do a lot of big houses up on uh, Gull Lake and whatnot. So a uh, thing that we like to boast ourselves about it a little bit is we are five-star rated with over 1,300 reviews. So we, uh, we put a lot of effort into our reports. It's all about matching effort. We understand how much effort you guys put into these buyers. Uh, we want to match it as much as possible and bring value as well. So when we do inspections, there's always, there's never a perfect house. We always want to bring value, meaning this is how you fix it. Here's the approximate cost of how you fix it or to fix it. Uh, so what we're doing is bringing value to the client so they can understand what they're purchasing. And last but not least is every inspection, again, matching effort. We give out cakes at the end of every inspection, nothing but cakes. Winner, uh, winner, to, chicken dinner. <laughs> yes, to the agent and to the clients. Um, what we want to try to do is promote the agents for being there. Uh, Cause a lot of times these buyers are not always rational when we go through uh, inspection and they'll twist our words up a little bit coming back to the agent after inspection being like, oh, my inspector says everything has to be fixed in this report. Um, we would never say that. <laughs> um, what they're trying to do is just play us against each other. So we always want to encourage the agents to be at every inspection. For one, it's a great educational piece because we do a one-hour walkthrough and we educate these buyers. that they know, We know the house better than a seller's when we're done. So. Um, so that's kind of where we're at with it. Every house is not perfect. We're going to tell them how this, the house is functioning, how to repair things, how to anticipate what might happen to this house. Um, if anything happens, they, they know what is going on as opposed to start calling contractors to figure out what is going on. So we can kind of predict things a little bit without trying to scare people, but just educating them. So that's where we're at. Any questions so far, guys? Cool. So Here's our services. We do quite a few services. And the reason why we do all these services is we want to control um, the atmosphere of the buy-in process. Um, so we do residential inspections. They start at 435. Our average cost is probably around that 485 for like a 2000 square foot house. Uh, 435 is kind of a rare oddity, less than a thousand square feet. Uh, we do commercial inspections. We are certified for commercial inspections. Uh, we've done up to 160 apartment buildings, 88. Um, commercial industry is really busy right now for us, uh, but we do a lot of them. And what we're doing with the commercial inspection is we're giving the buyers a zero to one year forecast for prices with quotes from um, actual contractors. So if it needs an HVAC system, a HVAC system, we'll actually give you a quote, an estimate on repairing that so you can negotiate this up in there. This is a, I've been in the commercial industry for a long time as well. And people just buy, buy buildings without knowing uh, to what to anticipate and what time frame to anticipate this stuff and for roofs and all that kind of stuff. And they're all big ticket items. So that's what we love to do with our commercial inspections is actually bring value to that. Townhouse condos, 335, they start radon testing. You guys all know radon testing. We do that. Uh, we do have contractors that we work with that will give discounts for our clients. Uh, so if a mitigation system is required, then um, they get a discount for the mitigation system. Sewer scopes, the same thing. Um, if we have a problem with the sewer scope, we have two contractors that we estimate out with, and they'll get two bids 
from us um, within 24 hours after the sewer scope window if we need any, if we do have any concerns with it. We also highly recommend sewer scopes on older houses. They're not perfect. Um, so we give older homes a, a strong leeway, uh, but we recommend insurance riders on our policies, our insurance policies. That's something that's new within the last year. I'm not sure if you guys knew about that, but you can add a main sewer line insurance a rider to your main insurance for like $70 a year. So, which helps pay for any kind of uh, major problems with sewer scopes. Level two chimney inspections we do. Uh, mold testing. Mold testing is another thing that we like to control because if you get a mitigation company come in, they're always going to find lots of mold. They're always going to find lots of costs. So what we do is we do our mold testing in-house and then we have contractors that we work with and send the report to them and we get estimates that way on proximate costs. Obviously, mold is once you start tearing into things, it gets it it adds up a little bit. Mold testing, you got to be really careful with. It opens a can of worms that we don't always want to go down. So um, normally what we always tell people that when we do mold testing is let us do the inspection first, let us find any kind of problems. And if we find problems, then we can kind of tell you um, if, if there's more major problems with it, with the mold testing portion of it. So stucco testing, that's an invasive testing where we drill holes into the stucco and we get into if there's moisture problems. Um, we try not to do stucco testing on 1950s houses. They normally don't have many problems with it. Uh, once we get into the 80s, 90s, 2000s, that's when we start seeing concerns with stucco. So, and that's our starting price uh, for that. We do water testing. So uh, if you are on well systems, most counties require the sellers to provide this, but if they don't, or if you want additional testing for arsenic, nitrates or something, we can do this for you guys as well. Another service we offer is a home watch service. So this is for your snowbirds that go down south. Uh, what we do is we come in, we, we customize these, these inspections where we come in maybe every two weeks, every week, and we run water, um, just kind of watch over for pests, um, run dishwashers, uh, fill pea traps so there's no sewer gases, just an overview of what it is. And we do a full report and we send pictures and report to the, to the clients, which are down south. So um, that's been pretty popular, just so you guys know, and it's relatively inexpensive. Um, I'm not sure if we'd go to Rochester though to do one of these just because of the cost. <laughs> Sorry guys, but uh, what we try to do is keep them closer to our houses. So awesome. any questions so far? Yeah, I have a question. Um, yeah. I just met with some buyers, so this is very timely. Um, yeah. They are concerned that, you know, how would they know if they're buying an older home, what the pipes are like, you know, you do a sewer scope, which I would assume is from the house to the you know, to the main sewer right out to the street. But how would they know if, you know, pipes have issues in the home that we can't see if it's a really old home? Yes. Yeah, so when we do our uh, inspections, what we're trying to do is shock the system within the in the uh, sewer system. And what that does, is it gives us little signs. Um, so if we do have older pipe systems, um, it gurgles a lot of times with us. We'll have slow drains. Um, the other thing is when we're on the roof, we're making sure that our vents are open. Uh, they're not clogged, which is going to preventing problems as well. So a lot of times when we dump all this water into a residential system, it will show us signs of, of problems. Not always, but sometimes. Uh, once we get into cast iron on older houses, we got to start being a little bit more concerned because cast iron will rust from the inside out. Uh, so they don't show themselves. I've actually had a situation where I've looked at maybe a little crack on a, on a piece of pipe and I touched it with my thumb and the pipe broke. <laughs> oh, wow. so I put a new okay. system in for them. <laughs> so we do have to be careful where that one, we can't always determine what is going on, but we can um, definitely do our best to try to come up with the, with a, uh, if there is any concerns with how much water we run. So and do yep. you, do you do a lot of sewer scopes? Like Bob, do you guys do sewer scopes on your houses up there? Uh, it depends. It, you know, uh, if it's a, you know, a, a neighborhood that's been around for a while, you know, like St. Paul, Minneapolis built, you know, 1950 or late or earlier, we'll typically do that. Um, we don't necessarily promote it we kind of leave it up to the buyer to have that conversation with the inspector at that point in time i think the one thing that you got to be careful of when you're writing up the purchase agreement is that the sewer scope can be technically considered an invasive test right so you got to make sure that you have that you kind of have it covered with um yeah, you know, in the purchase agreement stating that you're going to do potentially some invasive testing, probably, and you're probably getting there uh, regarding the, 
the uh, stucco testing. We'll learn a little bit more, I'm sure, about that, if that's invasive or not invasive. Um, but it all kind of depends on the vintage of the house, Kelly, as okay. far as the yeah, buyers. We don't, we don't see very know. much of it, but we do have a couple neighborhoods in Rochester where they're it, they're known for having potential. You know, they're so old, they're in our, our historic area. But other than yeah. that, we don't. But it's, you know, it's probably not a bad idea, no matter what, especially if you're in a mature neighborhood. You've got lots of trees, you got tree roots and whatnot. So, mm -hmm. Troy, what mm -hmm. do you recommend doing this? I mean, what do you tell people? Yes, this is a great conversation. I think this is going to be, there's so much information here that we'll probably do another um, PowerPoint again for on something like this. But what we do with, with our clients is we send out an email after they book with us, educating them on radon, sewer scopes, and all that kind of stuff. What we recommend, anything prior built prior to 1980 is we highly recommend a sewer scope at that point. Uh, once we get into the 80s, the PVC piping uh, was pretty Pretty dominant in that the, that stage, then PVC piping does have a pretty good um, history behind it with with not having problems unless it's an install problem. So we do run across problems, but um, what we tell people like Minneapolis, St. Paul, um, anticipate cleaning your your sewer lines every one to two years uh, just because of the style of pipe that is in there, the clay style, the clay but. Um, clay tile pipe. So that's what we recommend. And then we talked about the insurance rider as well, uh, which is always another um, back of plant or another deal. But uh, we do we do a lot of sewer scopes. So uh, just because of people's has history, you know, all it takes is one person to have a sewer line back up and they tell their whole family. So nobody wants that problem when they move into a new house. And we, yeah, so that's where we're at. Well, didn't mean to waylay the conversation here, but thank you. That was helpful. No, this is this is awesome. So sewer scopes has a lot of value to them. So I I would recommend them uh, because the cost of repair is so great. So and they are responsible for them. So one more quick yeah. question on that. Sorry, how long do those normally take? Actually, to the sewer the scopes. Inspection? Yeah, sorry to the scope. Yep. Okay. Well, our residential inspections, we normally do three and a half hours, and that includes a one hour walkthrough. Our sewer scopes, we try to set them up at the same time as a residential okay. inspection um, okay. or at half an hour before. Our inspectors are certified for sewer scopes as well, and they all have their sewer cameras with them. Uh, so we can throw them in at any time. Uh, they're relatively flexible. We can go down small drain pipes. If we do have a problem, we can be we can try to investigate right away. So uh, gotcha. sewer scopes normally an hour or less to do a sewer scope. So gotcha. Thank you. Okay. All right. Are you guys good with our services and how we kind of control things and how we use contractors that are trying not to sell everybody? Uh, there's a lot of contractors. So we want to control and protect our clients in, in a reasonable way. So all our contractors are middle of the road contractors. They're not high end contractors. They're no, they're not low end contractors. Um, and what to work with us, you have to have a realistic viewpoint of things because not everybody can afford a full sewer line repair or, or situation where a lot of times we can repair just four feet of this and the sewer line is going to be just fine and you're going to save $5,000. So our contractors are willing to do stuff like that. Those are with a liner system. So, you know, a lot of no dig options out there now for sewer lines. So, all right, guys. So what we're really going to talk about today is the cause and effect of exterior moisture. Um, what I want to do is educate you guys when you come up onto the house, or at least give you my opinion what is going on. When you come up onto a house on what to watch out for, like I was saying earlier, is every house pretty much tells its story uh, right when you walk up to it or walk around it. Uh, it's going to tell you its kind of characteristics, how it's going to function as a designer uh, for many years. Uh, we, we love to build these roof lines that are so fancy from the street, but they're not very functional for our foundation or, um, yeah, for our foundation. So we're going to get into this one. Does anybody have any questions or anything right now? Okay. So here is a house uh, that, that uh, we did an inspection on. Um, right away when we go up to this house, we're going to have three high moisture concern areas. Um, so we're going to start with number one on the left-hand side. Uh, what, what I'm talking about by high moisture areas is where the roof line pushes a lot of moisture to the foundation or to the exterior of the house uh, to the point where gutter systems really can't keep up and, and heavy rains. Um, so that's where I have. So number one is going to be on your left-hand side. You think of this one as not a major player in this. But what we see with this type of roof, roof line with that one is erosion around driveways, uh, we, where a lot of times where we have asphalt that goes right up to the 
to the driveway or to the garage, uh, we get that erosion underneath that asphalt uh, that happens quite a bit. And this will be a huge culprit for that. Um, the other thing is, is we get a lot of deterioration on the brick veneer because it's pushing a lot of water against the brick veneer uh, with a roof line like this. And then obviously foundation problems, I um, mean, erosion of block because of the excess moisture that's pushed over there or it's settlement of the foundation. So, and then we get to number two, um, you can see there's like three different roof lines that are pushing, four different roof lines that are pushing into this area. So when you walk up to the house, I, I want you guys to be really um, aware of this one where right away you're gonna see most likely settlement of sidewalks uh, because of a lot of water that goes into this area. Water is the number one compaction for soil. Uh, so you put a lot of water in there and then the, the steps and the sidewalks are settling. So watch for that. And that's gonna give us an indication of how this house is managing the moisture. Um, a lot of settlement in this area. Now we're gonna to have to really pay attention once we get on into the basement area of this one as well. Uh, it's really trapping a lot of water in this area right to the left of the entryway. So, and then we get to number three is again, we're looking for erosion of the steps and the sidewalks from this moisture problem. Um, and the reason I'm bringing this up is, is a lot of times what we can do is just say, oh, this is, this is a sidewalk is settling because of the lack of gutters on this house or um, the compaction. So if we were to mud jack this, the sidewalk, that should help, you know, um, uh, you know, this is this is why it's happening. And this is what's happening from that is just kind of educating our buyers right away. And because there's a lot of good houses that have just minor problems, if we can set their mind at ease right away, uh, we highly recommend that. So and then it kind of helps our inspectors out as well, is there's not gonna be a lot of surprises, because you guys are so educated in this as well, being like, oh, your inspector is going to talk about this, your inspector is going to talk about this. So as we're up, then we get to number three over there. Again, we're putting three roof lines right into this area, uh, settlement of sidewalk and, and steps right there. Um, this one's gonna be a little bit different because it's gonna push the moisture down the hill. We could possibly see moisture in the basement and settlement on the far right corner of the foundation because of the washout of the water. So that's the things that we're gonna be watching for. This is stuff that's gonna go through your head as you're walking up on the house. You're not gonna verbally say any of this uh, because we don't wanna say anything before we see any problems, but this is kind of what we're watching for. Any questions so far, guys? Okay. So, and then once we get into older houses um, and the backside of houses, grading and lack of gutters um, are a huge problem with houses of older age. So when I say older age, we're gonna say 1980s. We're gonna, you hear me say 1980s a lot because it's kind of the transition for things is houses prior than 1980s, we weren't sealing the foundations back then. So any water that goes against the foundation will come into the foundation if that makes sense. When it's sealing, there is a, a liquid sealer we put on the outside to help manage the moisture portion of it. The other thing is, is older houses, like the 1950s, didn't have sump pump systems so or drain tile system. So water that goes against the foundation um, doesn't have anywhere to go other than come into the basement. So these are gonna be areas as you walk around the outside of the houses, you're gonna watch for and take mental note. So when you go inside the house, you can identify if we're gonna have any problems and you can really hone in on certain areas. Uh, for example, like this one around the gas meter right there, we do have a gutter downspout, but it's pushing the water right back against the house. And then all that grading is pushing the water back towards the house. So this house has a high probability of foundation concerns and moisture concerns inside of it. So, and I'm probably not telling you guys anything you don't know at this point, uh, but what we're trying to do is just kind of set the stage here. So any questions? Yeah, Troy, when did they start doing drain tile around properties? Do you remember or do you know? It, it varied by cities and counties and stuff like that. We always say about the 1980s is when okay, we started. So the same more. time that they started yep. sealing the foundations. Okay. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. That's what we, when we started paying more attention. People started using their basements for livable space um, a little bit more, you know, prior to in the fifties, it wasn't really used for livable space. It was more storage and, and canning and stuff. So, okay. Hey, Troy, so, um, yeah. super quick, super quick question. Actually, it goes to the next slide that you were just going to pop up. Um, yeah. I, I showed a home yesterday and just a, a, a framing question, I guess. And, and maybe, you know, this answer, maybe you don't, but the, most of the walls are 16 inch on center for the for the framing. Um, the walls in the basement on this house were 24 inches on center. 
Um, it was it was built in 2000. Is that is that an issue? Um, that's a really hard one now because uh, you can build walls at 24 on center, but the substrate that you put up against it has to be upgraded to accommodate that that span. So okay. Okay. it's just like the roofing materials when we put our trusses on, they're 24 on center, but we have to put a, a decking that's thicker than normal. You can go to 16 inch on center on trusses as well. You can go to a thinner decking material at that point. So okay. um, it kind of goes for, uh, is it a wood foundation? No, it's a black foundation. Oh, it was uh, a black foundation. It, okay. Yeah, and the, and the three three of the four walls were um were twenty four, and one wall was was uh, sixteen. So I found that a little <laughs> odd. Well, most likely, most of the time, basements are constructed by homeowners. Um, so we see everything. <laughs> okay. Okay. So that's, you know, most of the time you're missing heat sources in basements when homeowners do it, because that's one thing they skip. Um, they're just like, well, oh, just sheet rock over it. And then they, everything's finished and they realize it's cold down there and there's no heat sources. Uh, people forget so about that one. So then so, the, then the question, the question on that is the, if the, if the new buyers wanted to come in and finish the, the lower level, um, would they, um, and they, they had to have inspections, would an inspector require them to change that framing? Um, every inspector is different. Every city is different. Every district is different. Um, so I can't answer 100% that, but I would have okay. to venture to say no, they would not because it's a non-structural wall. Okay. Okay. So, Good to know. Yep. Appreciate so that. Thank structural you. walls, then it gets to be a little bit more you know, funky because of the fact that is it a two by four wall, two by six wall, you know, what's a header system on top of it. There's a lot more that goes into it after that. So, okay. All right. So, and then, you know, you. another great presentation that will probably go down here sometime soon as well is wood foundations. A lot of people don't know how to identify wood foundation or the design, understanding the design of wood foundations. Um, I've been lucky enough to build six of them myself. Um, so I understand, you know, what to watch out for, the spacing of things and how it was built. And, um, and people get really scared about wood foundations and wood foundations are are wonderful. Um, they're very warm. They're very cozy. They breathe really well. They insulate really well. Um, and it's just like any foundation, if they're not managed correctly, they fail. So it's, so that's why people have a bad reputation or people have a bad viewpoint of wood foundations because they do see failure, but you can see every wood concrete foundation has failure too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. We would love to hear, we would love to have a separate thing on that. We have a big builder down in our area that does wood foundations and he's, they've been around for 30 plus years and people get really wigged out about it. And they're like, Oh, I don't want a wood foundation. And I would always say, if you do your research, you'll actually find that they are warmer. They're, they're a great basement. You know, it's just hard to have people wrap their brains around that. So that'd be a great class for later. I'm a yeah, huge so supporter of it. So yes. We have the same thing up here too with a builder that does a lot with wood foundations as well. Yeah. So that would be a great one. Yep. Yes, absolutely. And the biggest thing is identifying because wood foundations are 90% finished. So they're really hard to identify. Um, so I can walk you through on key things that we need to watch out for. If we don't have for them, then we are going to be a little bit more concerning on things. Um, you know, and walk you through why we space the studs. So uh, Bruce, this is a good one. Um, you know, for spacing on studs with wood foundations, that spacing is all out the window. It's all based on the soil outside, how deep you're going, all that kind of stuff. We'll go all the way down to six inch spacing sometimes on certain soils on wood foundations. So, um, so it's all, and I'm not an engineer, just so you guys know, but I've built a few of them. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, um, so this foundation, so you can see this is a typical um, moisture into a older basement system. What happens with the negative grading or lack of gutters, it puts moisture against the outside of the foundation wall, and then water will go down through the blocks until it hits the footing system and then weeps out through the bottom of the footing systems. So that's very common. Um, and this, you could be behind walls, uh, finished walls with a situation like this. So this is why we do mold testing. If we see water problems at the base of our uh, finished areas, this could what it, this could be what it looks like behind there if uh, things weren't corrected. So, um, so this would be a good example if we did have problems. Moisture te mold testing would be a good situation because we have active leaking. Now it's what type of molds, how much mold we have. Uh, when we do mold testing, there is no standard that we really go by. Uh, the state of Minnesota doesn't have certifications. They don't have levels. Um, it, it, it's kind of 
we use our experiences and our certifications to kind of guide us a little bit. We use the European um, gauges of things, so we have certain mold counts. So anything under, for example, like a thousand molds bowl counts, as long as they're healthy mold or healthy molds, um, not dangerous molds, uh, is a pretty standard living space. Uh, so every house has mold in it, just so you guys know. And then as the mold count goes up, then we have more concerns. And then every house tells us a story with what kind of mold is in it. If it is an active mold or if it's a wood growing mold or uh, there's so much that goes into mold testing. So that's why the cost is what, um, and we, yeah, that's, we'll get into that one another time too. That's a rabbit hole that we go into. So we talked about ceiling basement. So if we have negative grading on newer houses, we normally don't get a lot of water into our basement systems because of the drain tile systems and the sealant on the outside. These are more older houses uh, that we really want to watch out for. Um, and then as we push water against our foundation, uh, we could run into foundation damage as well. So, so to manage moisture on the exterior, uh, if we are not seeing foundation problems with cracks and whatnot, um, a drain tile system is a good option to manage the moisture that's going down from the from the outside. Um, if you want to put a drain tile system in, the cost for drain tile is about $100 per foot. So if you guys are going to an older house, 1950s house, you see moisture um, in the basement because of lack of grading or lack of gutters, it's $100 a foot basically to get it in. So that's just kind of a a guideline. I mean, obviously you need a contractor to estimate everything, but that's a good guideline. So, and you can just do one wall. You don't have to do all walls. So um, if you just have the back side of the house that has negative grading on it, or it has a concern area where a hill's pushing down into it, you can just do the back side. So it's pretty important to do. Uh, the other option is the grading. Yeah, so we always recommend if we have water in our basements, number one, add gutters, fix your grading. That's going to be your cheapest options. Um, to correct this water problems. Most of the time, water can be directed away from foundation and fixed. So uh, most of the time when we have water in the basement, it's because of grading, gutters, balance boats, all that kind of stuff. So gutters run about 20 to $25 a foot. So adding gutters, that's kind of what we're looking at now from contractors. And grading is really difficult to give you a cost estimate uh, because every it's not as simple as just grading out four feet most of the time. <laughs> maybe it is, maybe it's not. Um, and, and then we recommend putting a poly down uh, and putting your, your finished scape over top of that. Poly will help direct water away from the foundation as well. So uh, putting, if you have a negative grading, just putting wood chips over it does not fix negative grading, just so you guys know. <laughs> so as the water will go right through the wood chips and right into the foundation still. So, so that's your options for fixing those. So if you're with buyers, if you have water and they love the house, you can give them some numbers right away and see if you guys want to still run off or so. So foundation cracks. Um, and you guys can watch my time. I love talking. So please just kind of let me know my timing here as, as we go. Um, so foundation cracks, there's multiple different foundation cracks that you should be watching for. So for example, um, any crack that is a quarter of an inch or less, it's pretty safe. We're not normally worried about structural concerns at that point. So, but we, we are aware of what had happened. We had a failure to the concrete or to the foundation, fixing the grading, getting gutters, all that kind of stuff is important to prevent future cracking because the structural has been compromised a little bit. But in the industry, um, the information I get, just so you guys know, is coming from safe basements. Um, that's who I work with for my basement contractor. Um, they're very they're very easy to work with uh, and efficient. So that's right, cost efficient as well. Um, so types of cracks is number one and number four, uh, as you see on the left, those are caused by stress cracks. Uh, so water against the outside of the foundation um, will put a static pressure against the foundation and cause the horizontal cracks. So that is a pretty indica indication that lack of gutters, um, grading, and we're putting a lot of moisture into the soil on the outside. We always see it about three to four in blocks down from the top. Um, those stress crack or static pressures, or we call them frost cracks as well, because as that moisture is saturated into the soil, it freezes, it expands. We all know that once water freezes, it expands and it pushes in our foundations. So um, those two cracks are pretty easy to fix, if you will, and pretty, uh, we'll talk about costs of, of repairing those in the future here as well. Once we get to number three, those are step cracks that go down. 
um, those get a little bit more complicated because step cracks could be twofold. One, it could mean the footing system in the corner of the house is settling. If that's the case, we'll talk about the cost of that in the future here as well. Uh, it gets a little bit more expensive, but step cracking doesn't always indicate the the footing system is settling. It could be a step crack that's from static pressure on the outside as well. But you normally see a displacement with that where the walls pushed in a little bit. So step cracks with the push in is grating most of the time, um, putting water against the foundation. Step cracks without displacement coming in uh, could mean the footing system is settling. In general, when we see step cracking, uh, with no displacement, you could look at the floor and look for cracks in the floor because most of the time the floor will crack and settle as well along with that. So, and so number two and number three kind of go hand in hand. So this gets a little bit more complicated. Um, do you guys have any questions on this one? All right, sounds good. So horizontal cracks. Um, this is how we recommend to fix it. There's a lot of different companies out there that have a lot of different opinions. So please just take my opinion as one of the opinions out there. So these are carbon fiber strap systems. Um, these are put up against the foundation and they ran bars back into the soil. And these are, so cost of something like this. So if you see a horizontal crack that's more than a quarter of an inch, um, we, we recommend a strap system at this point. Strap systems are every post that you see right there is $850 to install. So for example, like this one would be, I don't have the math in front of me, but basically $2,500, $2,600 to install something like this. So just to give you an idea. So if you have a whole 30 foot wall um, that has a horizontal crack, um, then this is a good system to go through and resupport it. This resupporting is basically, they put those carbon fiber strap, straps in there and we just resupport the wall and they guarantee them for life. And they can be corrected. So they, they give you torsion bars where you can come through and tighten things up and try to get that wall back up to, to, to straight. The other thing that's important is sealing those cracks so water doesn't come in. Now we have an open crack in our foundation. So grading is still important to manage on the outside um, and gutter systems because uh, those cracks are present at that point. So water sealing is pretty important. And that goes for newer houses that have a water uh, sealing system on the outside as well. So any kind of questions here? No, okay, the spacing is, so the bar spacing that you see there can never be more than six feet apart, just so you guys know. We can't do like a 10 foot span. Uh, they have to be within six feet, four to six feet. So just so you guys know, if you were at a price out of a foundation wall and it's 30 feet, you need them every six feet roughly. So to give a ballpark, again, your contractors, you gotta get a solid estimate from your contractors. So, but, okay. So now if we have the step cracking, um, here's a, another system that pushes it up. Uh, these push pier systems work really well for lifting up foundations. Uh, most of the time when we have a settlement of foundation, it was built incorrectly because of the, the soil that was the footing systems were put on were um, under or over excavated and it settled over time. Or a lot of times gutters uh, will dump a bunch of water into the corners of the house and start settling the footing system. And the water is, is very intrusive uh, portion of it. So these systems get a lot more. So when you have step cracking and, and cracks in the floor, it gets a little bit more expensive. And this system for repairs starts at $12,000 uh, for a very minor corner crack uh, starts at $12,000 and it'll go up to $50,000 relatively fast. So the settlement of the foundation uh, footing system, it's a little bit more complicated. It's a little bit more difficult to estimate, but just so you know, for sure, it's $12,000. <laughs> so it's not a $6,000 fix, you know, kind of like the other system with the horizontal cracks. So Troy, so, I have a question. What if you have a slab on grade? I mean, you still have footings and yeah. whatnot, but you know, if you've noticed like one corner of the house, because maybe the grade has gone off or whatever, and that's settled, you know, what about that? Is that something where this system would help or, I mean. 100% you know, the system would help with that. And we see a lot of uh, slab on grades that settle. So, okay. so it's very common. So, because the footing system still has to be below our frost line. Yep. So, but yeah, so it's, it's going to be a little bit less expensive to fix because we're not digging down as deep as a full basement. But again, it's, it gets more complicated and more expensive really fast. 
So, okay. So any other questions on this? Are you guys finding this useful? Mm -hmm. Very yeah. useful. So, so that's pretty much the end of it. Um, I wasn't sure on how much time we really wanted to spend that. I was told about 30 minutes, something like that, 30 to 45 minutes. So hopefully I stayed within that time frame. Um, here's my contact information. So if you do have any questions, this is my cell phone number. My company, it, my uh, main line is my cell phone. My wife hates it, but again, this is the type of business I want to run is being able to answer my questions and text messages. If you guys are out and about and you guys see something that you normally don't see, text it to me and I can answer relatively quick. Um, phone calls get a little bit difficult because I still do inspections. Uh, we don't answer our phone during inspection. So text messages work a little bit better. I can reply back by text messaging. Um, emails, I'm not very good with emails. I'll be straight up honest with you guys. <laughs> so, um, I, have but a quick question. <laughs> I have a quick question. I recently yeah. had an inspection with, they found a bat up in the uh, garage attic. Yes. Is it true you have to have a certain bat like uh, person? to get rid of them it is true yep it, it does um, because you just don't get rid of bat i mean you do get rid of bats but the problem with bats is um what they do is we do like a chicken wire um at their entrances so mm -hmm. and we set up this chicken wire so they can get out but they can't get back in so a situation so it's really hard for the homeowner to be able to manage that and then every crack the size of a pencil they can get in pretty much anywhere um, all has oh. to be seen up for the function to work correctly. So isn't it, isn't it true as well with bats that you can't like just exterminate them because they're protected? Yes, that is. Mm -hmm. That's from what I hear as well, but I'm not a certified pest. <laughs> yeah, I hear the <laughs> is same it true thing. If you have one bat, usually there's more. Yes, hundred percent. So we see bats quite often huh. in attic spaces, and there's never just one. <laughs> okay, interesting. So, um, the other thing I want to point out is our website is on here. We do online booking, which works the best for us and for your clients. If you could direct them to our website and then they can book the times that they would like, that's going to come up available for the inspectors as well. Um, it's just going to lock in a time for you guys, because if you're texting me and I'm working all day and I don't get to it till six o'clock and you want it tomorrow morning inspection time, it could fill up by the time I get to that text message. So online booking will hold the times for you guys as well. So Troy, I have a question. I have a question for you, real quick. If you're good, are you still good on time? Like we can ask. Oh, I'm you. really good on time. Yep. Right, yep. right. Yep. So, um, you know, we've had a few inspection companies that we've referred to our clients, and um, you know, what we try to do as agents is we want to be a resource for them. But at the end of the day, we want the buyer to choose the inspector that they want to work with. Helps us with liability, etc. The problem is, is a lot of these inspection companies are always upselling services and many times offering services that may or may not be required, i.e. a sewer scope for a home that was built in 2018. You know, how do you handle that piece of it with the client? So if we were, if I was gonna refer you a buyer, I'd be like, hey, give Troy a call or, or we book it online. How, how does that process work with you interacting with the client typically? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, so we are not an upsell company. Um, I straight up, like I said, a lot of people will select the mold testing right away. And I just come back to them and say, let's just do the inspection first. And then we can do the mold testing unless you have major health concerns. And then at that point, we we don't mess around with it. We do mold testing to tell them exactly what's in the house um, because we don't know what affects them exactly at that point. It could just be a level. But so what we do in our process is one, we send out an email, um, kind of walking them through right on sewer scopes, all our services. Um, mm -hmm. So we educate them as much as possible. And then if they start selecting things, for example, like if you have a 2020 house um, and they start selecting the radon, the sewer scope and all this other kind of stuff, I will give them a call and being like, hey, just so you guys know, and I just did this yesterday on the townhouse in Maple Grove, uh, the lady selected everything and I just we back down to a residential inspection at the end of the day because the house was so new, the sewer line normally doesn't have a lot of problems with it. But again, that's something that we cannot visually see and we can't 100% tell them. But we also talk about insurance, insurance riders on your main insurance for your sewer line. They're $70 a year. If she does have any problems with that, um, that she does have a assistance program with insurance to help her out with, a, with that. 
So um, it gets really difficult with sewer lines just because of the fact that people are like, well, as a, what's the condition of it? Well, we can't tell you 100%. You have to run a camera yeah. and own it. So, but like I said, 1980s um, and after, we normally don't see a lot of problems unless we have installed concerns. What happens a lot of times when we install the pipe is we dig this trench and then we start putting our pipe in there. And if they over dug it, a lot of times what they do is they just build up one foot sections and set a pipe on there and then try to um, fill around the pipe. Most of the time what it does is settle the pipes down and creates bellies. So, but again, PVC is pretty resilient and those bellies normally flow pretty good still uh, just because of the type of material it is. But um, we see bellies quite often in PVCs where normally you don't see breaks. Um, and the other thing is rocks. If the pipes are put on rocks, it'll put big dents into the pipe and has a possibility of breaking down the road as well. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, Bob, but it's it gets complicated. You know, radon, right we can't visually see or smell or anything like that. So if they're concerned about it, it's, it is what it is. But mitigation systems um, um, are in place in a lot of newer houses, all the newer houses by code. Um, so at that point, it's kind of like you spend $200 on a radon test, or if you're concerned, just put a fan in for $400. <laughs> so yeah. that's what I always tell people. Yeah. If it's a 2022 house, just put a fan in. It's going to take care of it. So yeah, no, that was very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. So Troy, yeah, I'm, so, like and I apologize said, if I missed this, but so <laughs> you, you know, you do the mold inspection or you do the radon inspection. Do you do the mitigation as well? Or do you just, okay. So you don't do the both, right? Which sometimes we don't do that. I think it's a conflict of interest. Um, it'd be really smart business plan for us to do it, but I think it's a conflict of interest. That's why we work with contractors directly <laughs> that believe in our same viewpoint of things. So, um, and fall into the price range that I think is a reasonable price range as well. Uh, wow. So radon, you can get systems up to $4,000 for radon and get them down to $1,500. So most of our radon mitigation systems are $2,000 to $2,500 that the people that we recommend out. So, and that's with a discount because they don't have to pay for referrals if they come directly from us. So they give the discounts to our clients. Nice. So. Good. So same thing with sewer scopes. It's a, it's the same thing as, is we give you quotes from contractors that we believe uh, are treating our clients the best in your clients as well. So the biggest thing at the end of the day is if you do your job right and we do our job right, we are heroes and we're going to be referred out. That's, that's our goal. I mean, that's what we want to do is match effort. And we want, we know where our business comes from. If we're not doing a good job and being thorough and explaining things and giving all the information correctly to our clients, um, it's not going to make you guys look good. And then neither one of us is going to get referrals. So that's, that's where we put a lot of time and effort into our walkthroughs and understanding. Like I said, we're not here to upsell because that looks bad on you guys. So now so. you mentioned earlier that you could show us like how to age mechanicals, like looking at the furnace and whatnot. So how, I mean, I know everything's kind of got, I mean, different brands might have different codes in terms of how to look for the age on a furnace. The water heater is a little bit more straightforward most of the time, but any, any tips on that? Well, so what we use is you can just look at, so all the serial numbers on the furnace and the, in the water heaters or any of the uh, appliances for the most part, uh, have the year, the week and the year, uh, advertising their serial numbers. So if you have a ream water heater, you can just type in ream water heater age, and then it's going to pull up, um, an option for selecting intelligence uh, program. And you select on that website and it's gonna go through your serial number options because they probably have like six different serial number changes uh, to age something. And so you just Google it and then look at your serial number and compare it to what it is and it'll tell you exactly what the year it was manufactured. So uh, I can definitely do another presentation on that one because that's really shows a lot of value. What we're trying to do is if you guys could eliminate a lot of su surprises um, up front before they put an offer in, it makes our job easier and it makes your job easier too. <laughs> so if we know the furnace is 20 years old, they don't have to hear from us and be like, oh my gosh, you know, because the service life on furnaces are 15 to 20 years and it's dropping, you know, that's kind of where it's, it's at. Well, so. and in, in our, you know, market where things are pretty competitive and people are going in sometimes without inspections, it's yep. helpful up on the front end, you know, if we're able to say, oh yeah, the furnace is this old, because unfortunately, which I disagree with, our disclosures 
do not require the sellers to put the ages of their mechanicals other than the roof, right? Their guesstimation. And it's, yeah. I just think that's silly, right? They should, they should have to put the ages of the main mechanical systems. But anyway, um, you know, if you don't know how to find that or what to look for, um, I, I think that's, that's unfortunate, right? I mean, we need to, we need to be better. So this is great. Yep, absolutely. So it, we're just doing everyone a service, the more knowledge we have and what we can do. So, yeah, yeah. awesome. So awesome. Um, invasive inspections, you know, we, we touched on that a little bit, uh, invasive inspections, um, try to write up offers with invasive, just kind of write in over already. So then if we do need to do a sewer scope, it doesn't come back and, you know, be like, oh, now we got to go ask for invasive inspections or, you know, if it is a stucco house um, in the 2000s or 90s, um, throw the invasive in there right away. It just kind of shortens our whole process down uh, because once it, once we talk to them about a stucco house in the 1990s or they Google it, the whole world is, you know, the stucco houses in the 90s are all bad. That's what the internet says. <laughs> So and you said we, after the invasive. 80s, stucco wasn't bad after the 80s? Uh, that's when we start getting into the, yeah, after the 80s, yep, earlier, okay. that's kind of where it's at. We don't see as many concerns um, with it for structural um, deterioration. So at least with my experience. So other people might have different opinions, but my experiences are those houses are meant to breathe a little bit more and they, any moisture that gets in there breathes. We should be sealing up cracks with stucco still. So there's still maintenance that needs to be done on stucco, but they tend to breathe a little bit more. I'm talking like a 1900s stucco house. We normally don't see too many problems uh, with those things, but again. Well, this is a great recommendation to do invasive for sewer scope. And we don't do a lot of them here, but I didn't, never would have thought that as an invasive procedure um, yep. or, or yeah. inspection. Yeah. So that's a really good tip. So we've most, always used it for stucco. So yeah, most sellers just kind of let it go by. Uh, but every once in a while we get one that are like, nope, that's invasive. You can't do it. And like, oh gosh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So if that. you guys can just start writing them, I mean, a lot of agents are starting to write in invasive right into every purchase agreement. Uh, so that means that we can open up the attic access as well. Um, you know, because a lot of times we'll have sealed attic accesses. Once we get into newer houses, we don't recommend breaking the seals uh, just because of the process in place and, and how the attic functions more with these newer houses it's so important to keep that attic sealed um than us getting into it so that's where we're at but older houses it's so important so to get into the attic space awesome yeah, yeah Sorry, really I you also had maybe mentioned something about just kind of how to look at windows and get a feel for age or you know the condition of the windows which i know is kind of the same thing you can't always know for sure but just for yeah. i think that's one big thing that can be a humongous cost that people don't always know to look for. Yes, aging windows get a little gets a, gets a little bit difficult. Um, so what we do in inspection is we open and shut every single window because the ones that you don't do is going to be the ones that don't work. Um, we're checking the seals, making sure they're not brittle. Uh, because if you open up a window and you feel brittle seals, that's kind of telling us the window's not as functioning as intended. Moisture is going to come in, air leaks going to come in, frost is going to get in there. Uh, but a lot of the windows have their their numbers, their dates on inside the windows as well. So you can look in the corners of the windows and you'll have dates in the manufacturer or in between the window panes, um, they'll have, have dates and stuff in there as well. So you can age those. But most of the time, you know, from the old clad style casement windows uh, where we had aluminum on the outside, wood on the inside, where we see the, the moisture or the dry rot on the bottom side of the windows, most of the time that can be changed or or reduce the the amount of moisture coming in by there's caulking on the corners of the windows that wears out after about 10 years so just adding some caulking to those corners out there will prevent that water from coming in and and riding out the bottom side of those casement windows mm -hmm. um, so that's that's something that's really easy to fix um, and it causes a lot of damage so uh, we do talk a little bit about options for repairing windows um, so a lot of times if the window is, is a casement window and the bottom is rotted out, um, you can replace the sashes. So you don't have to replace the whole windows as that, an option. Right. Um, so th that that's a huge cost savings. Um, I used mm -hmm. to talk pricing on those a little bit, but contractors pricings have gone up and I lost track of where they're at right now. But normal window sashes are approximately $300. 
than labor to replace them. Um, that's kind of where we're at. It gets quite a bit less than changing all the windows. Uh, but now you're changing sashes throughout a whole house. Now it starts getting be pretty close to you change the windows out I'll note with sure. new at that point, but just replacing a few of them, it's way better to do the sashes as opposed to replace windows. So gotcha. So if you just see a little of that moisture that you know is not uncommon in a wood wooden framed window, yep. it doesn't necessarily have to be a cause of panic. You can caulk yep. some areas and yeah, you can caulk it. So where the two metals come together and the bottom side of that window it's they've changed it now the design has changed now for the window manufacturers now uh, we don't have the same problems but in the 80s 90s 2000s um they were just caulking those outside gotcha. it was a maintenance item um okay. so and as soon as that caulking wore out it allows the water to get from the outside into the corner of that window sash and come into the wood right. so just caulking that goes a long ways so we've actually i don't know if you guys remember that october 13th storm of this last year with the heavy rains and the winds mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, we've gotten a lot of calls for windows where like I lived in this house for 20 years. My windows never leaked. And then that storm came through and this, that driving rain made, it was like streams of water coming in yeah. from there. And I was like, just go get a, you know, a tube of caulking and, and they're like, and spray some water on it later. And they're like, it fixed. So huh. like, yeah, it was pretty yeah. easy. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. So awesome. and that, that's kind of how we operate our inspections is we walk them through. We try to be realistic with things. It doesn't always pan out for us. Uh, because sometimes it comes back and be like, oh, I, you know, I know you told me to do this. I didn't do it. Now we have bigger problems. And, you know, now it's, you know, people like yeah. to blame other people. So we do try to take a realistic viewpoint on things, but it does bite us in the butt every once in a while. So, yeah, but it's my business where I get to operate it how I want. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know we appreciate when inspectors don't just strike fear about every single thing. I mean, it's good to know the problems, but we also don't want to just scare people when there is a solution like that or something you know yes so. absolutely and i feel the same way i mean that's that's how i feel it's is that scare tactic is just a yeah. um a way a company manages their liability so right. okay. well and it's so, just yeah. expectations right i mean us as agents preparing our clients to have realistic expectations i mean i don't care if the house is new or not you have so many hands that go into the building process of a home right there's gonna be things that either might be missed or whatever but it's not the end of the world right there's a way to fix almost everything so it's yeah. it's just a matter of going in with realistic expectations and then having the right inspector who can present the issue that comes up and the potential, you know, options for addressing those things. So yeah. that's great. And the nice thing that we do with our reports. So I, I designed our report about three years ago. Now we color code everything. So we put everything into perspective. So a red is going to be something that's a big ticket item or a safety concern. Uh, those are things that should be negotiated, you know, in kind of a, or that they should be aware of that they're buying into, not necessarily negotiated. Yeah. That's not our job to negotiate. Um, and then we have yellow, which is kind of a recommendation for improvements, uh, maintenance items, sealing concrete, you know, so driveways, we talk about sealing the cracks in the driveway because water continues to get down there. It's going to keep eroding it. Um, so those are just maintenance recommendations. If they don't do anything, it's going to get worse. And then blue is just kind of comments about the property, uh, meaning that if there's some small cracks in the walls, that's just expansion contraction. It's not a structural concern, um, just repaint things a little bit. So that's what we do is, so we don't have, we do have 40 page reports, but it's condensed into, you select on a button and it just loses all that other stuff that we put in there, what we inspect and all that other. And it just gives you the, this is what's going on with this house. So awesome. really easy to read. So perfect. Any other yeah. questions for Troy as we're getting to the top of the hour here before we head out? Think so. Awesome. Well, Troy, this has been super beneficial. I'm going to tell you, I've been in the business a very long time and I have two oh. pages of notes. So um, I, I picked up some fantastic tips just from ages, you know, like 1980s or, or before or after. I mean, those are things that I didn't know kind of that cut off and, and I get, it's just a, a generalization. Um, it is just general. Yeah. So, I mean, I just, I, there were some great, great things that I got from your presentation today. So thank you so much for being with us. Obviously you guys on the screen is Troy's information. If he can help you in any way with your clients, uh, do not hesitate to give him a call. I know we're down in Rochester, Troy, and you're not here. Uh, I wish you were, um, but uh, I, I may still call you or text you if I've got some questions. So um, if you guys 
Yeah. If you guys have any questions at all, just feel free to reach out to us or Troy directly. So real quick, could I just jump in real quick, Troy? Do you, how many yeah. inspectors do you have? Maybe I missed that. How many inspectors do you have on your team? Um, we currently have four at this point. Okay. Gotcha. So, okay. um, so we actually have one inspector, uh, James, he's located down in kind of young America area. So going to Rochester is probably not that far for him. So okay. I'd awesome. have to do the math on, on that, but you know, it's, he comes to the cities all the time. And that's like an hour. <laughs> okay. So maybe so, might be closer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It might even be closer. Who knows? Well, I this is good out. because my main inspector is probably going to retire in, in the next year. And so I've been sitting there going, Oh my gosh, who are we going to go with? Because plan B and C aren't so great. So um, yeah. So this will be lovely. Well, we put a lot of effort into it and that we're, we're still human. We're not perfect, but if we do have concerns or, or um, clients that are not happy, uh, we normally just take care of it right away. You know, a lot of inspection companies would be like, Oh, sorry, we missed that. Here's your money back for the inspection. Um, we don't have a lot of callbacks. I'll be honest with you. We put a lot of time and effort. And I have processes in place that the guys, we have a checklist of things that when we go into a room, um, so we don't miss things, but we are human still and things do happen. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, we'll go out and fix things if we need to. Um, that's, uh, that's just kind of where we're at. We want to make sure the clients are happy. Cause again, if we leave a happy client, it's, they're not happy with you and we're not getting referrals anymore. And we're, you know, how our referral business is it's for us, it's like 36% of our business is referral. Right. So we get where we did their brother and they're like, Oh, you have to use this inspector, you know, even though they use different agents. So, uh, we get a lot of referral business. So awesome. Awesome. Well, I can try. Bye. So yeah, thank you guys. Thanks, yeah, well, thank, thank you, you so much. You guys great. have a great rest of your week and um, we'll join you next week, Wednesday morning. Thanks again. Right. Troy. Thank Thanks, Kelly. Troy. Yep. Bye, Kelly, if you just want to come up with a, um, a, another training one, let me know. So I, I would love it. You just, if you want to just shoot some, actually what I'll do, Troy, is I'll email you um, yeah. some times like the openings oh. that we have uh, remaining and we'll get you on the calendar, whatever works for you. Yeah. So maybe at your next meeting, you can ask, you know, what, what is, where would they like to be trained at? And then we can maybe focus on that and keep plugging away at things. So Perfect. Well, I think that Wood Foundation, that the Wood Foundation is a definite must because we're, that's very big down in our area for sure. Yeah. So that's a big, I'm supposed to be writing a, a whole thing for the uh, state of Minnesota. And okay. we've been so busy, I haven't done that. So this will help me push to that state of Minnesota one as well. Awesome. So. Perfect. Well, thank you again. I really appreciate you, Troy. It was very nice meeting you, Kelly. Thank nice you. Nice to meet you too. All right. Bye-bye.